okay so this is lecture 33 and uh, the last thing we were doing was bungling this simple derivation of uh, this a intrinsic and extrinsic uh, information let me do that real quick hopefully it will work out now Okay, well, let me not say information, it's just intrinsic and extrinsic LLRs, right? Log likelihood ratio. So, the total log likelihood ratio, suppose we write it as capital L, I said that's going to be probability for ui equals 0 given, given the entire received vector. Okay, so I think we split the received vector into two parts, we said r0 and r1, right? divided by probability well log of this no? looks like looks like it's getting more log of probability that u equals 1 given r0 r1 okay so this is what we had and we're trying to look at the expression on top and try to split it into write it in some form so that this will split nicely the the trick to doing that is to stare at this expression carefully and then write it differently. So, the way I am going to write it is R0 is the output vector corresponding to u, right? R1 is the output vector corresponding to the parity sequence v, okay? So, I am going to split it uh, like that. I am going to say R0n which is the actual received value, well i, I am sorry, R0i which is the actual received value corresponding to ui and everything else, okay? So, for that, I am going to say R0 not equal to i and then the entire R1, right? So, actually you should take the entire R1, the parity bits are all uh, involved. So, I think the notation I had before was for simply the entire R without i, okay? So, that is not quite right. You have to split it carefully so that the parity part comes out nicely. So, for this, the first step, I think the first step was quite okay. I write it as a joint, joint uh, Thing. Okay, so R0 not equal to i, then R1. Okay, so the entire parity thing divided by the conditioning events density, which also I'll write as R0 not equal to i, R1. Okay, so this is fine. So the trick is to look at this expression. R i 0 given everything else u i equals 0 and then all the remaining r's ok. So, once you given once you are given that u i equals 0 ok you know R i 0 is going to depend on nothing else no none of the other received values will play a part given u i is 0. So, all these other things while they are there I can throw them out because they, they will be independent of uh, this R i 0 ok. So, what what is that remaining thing there that is going to be u i equals 0 comma r not equal to i 0 and r 1 right. So, so this part is the same as this ok. I do not have to really write there because I know it is independent ok. And the denominator is going to stay the same. So, the denominator also let me write this as f of r i 0 given r not equal to i 0 r 1 multiplied by f of r 0 not equal to i r 1 ok. So, notice I cannot use the same argument for the first term in the denominator right because I am not given u i is 0 if I know for overall all possible values for u i the Ri's are not independent clearly we saw this example once before also ok. So, but once you are given a particular value for ui, it becomes independent. So, now it is a easy task of identifying what is it that I want ok. So, I am going to go to the next page hopefully you can carry out carry over ok 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 ok. So, so you see this uh, this probability that we are evaluating becomes f of ri 0 given ui equals 0 
times okay what you have there if you notice okay look at this this term f of ua equals 0 comma something divided by f of that same thing so that can be written as ua equals 0 given well probability that ua equals 0 given the remaining things right so you think of this whole thing as some b okay if you think of this as some b this is f of a comma b divided by f of b okay so this is the same as probability that ua is 0 given b okay so once i write that down i'll see this becomes probability that ua is 0 given r 0 not equal to i and then r1 and in the denominator i have something which will actually not change depending on 0 or 1 okay r0 not equal to i r1 okay so this is what i have for probability that ci is no ui is 0 given the entire vector r okay i'll have a similar expression for probability that ui is 1 given the entire vector r what will what will be the only change all these ua equals zeros will become ua equals 1 now when i divide that what will happen the denominator will cancel and then you will simply get the two terms so when you divide and take log of them you will see you will easily get capital l equals log of f of r i 0 given ui is 0 divided by f of r i 0 given ui is 1 plus log of these other things which I called actually extrinsic LLR given R0 not equal to I then R1 divided by probability that uh, UA equals 1 given R0 not equal to I. Why did you say the subject R is 3 parts? It's 3 parts? R1 is the received values corresponding to the parity bits. Okay, but if you just keep R1 and R0 not equal to Y as just one vector. Yeah, yeah, I could. No, but the parity corresponding to the ith stage should also be retained in this conditioning. Yesterday I didn't do that in the notation. So, okay. All right. So this this you'll know from BPS KWGN. What will this simplify to? e power 2 r i 0 by sigma square so you take log that will come out so you get 2 by sigma square times r i 0 plus that will not really simplify i will call that l extrinsic this is l total okay so this is the this is the important boxed formula from this derivation okay so what the bcgr algorithm will give you is right it will take r 0 and r 1 and I will give you these L totals for each i. Okay, So, you will get this vector i. So, what does the BCGR algorithm give you? It will take. So, for instance, one can write down this uh, bitwise MAP. Okay, So, let me write down the bitwise MAP description. So, the bitwise MAP, MAP decoder is going to take what all as input? Okay, R0, R1, anything else should I write down here as input? Yeah, maybe later I will have to write down. But now, right now I will simply say these are the inputs that it takes and then the output it would give you is this vector L1, L2 to L i. Okay, which is actually each L i well, I don't have i here, so I should put i here. Okay, so each li is li total, which is actually composed of two things, which is the intrinsic information plus intrinsic LLR plus the extrinsic LLR. That's what the bitwise MAP algorithm is going to give you. Okay, so this is one part. And let me remind you about the other things that we talked about. We talked about puncturing, right, which was required for the turbo code, and then I also give you a picture for the construction of the turbo code, which I'm going to repeat right now. So you'll see. Let's see how that thing looks. Okay, remember puncturing. Okay, so you remember puncturing, right? If you have several bits, you simply just drop the punctured bits from uh, transmission. So how will you deal with it in the receiver? 
the decoder, you will set those corresponding RA values to 0 in the BPSK AWG in case. Even for the bitwise MAP, you would do the same thing. Right? So one can imagine doing those things uh, quite easily. Okay. All right. So so let me go come back to this uh, turbo codes. Okay. So how do the encoder encoder looks? The encoder looks like uh, again. Once again, I'm going to take simple examples. I'll uh, I'll do a very simple example instead of doing the most general case. You have a message sequence E. There's one part, the systematic part, which goes out without any change. That's V0. Okay, and then you have encoder 1. Okay, what is this? This is the parity part of say some rate half convolutional uh, well recursive <laughs> recursive convolutional code right so that is something it would give you v1 okay if you have k bits here you'd get uh, well I might have to terminate right so so this is u plus I don't know did I have any notation for the terminations so okay I'll we'll simply put ut okay maybe you terminate maybe you don't okay so those are issues that we will we'll deal with later but in general one can terminate so this would be so let's say the memory is m here so this would be k plus m no actually this is not really the message part so let me just let me just leave it here let me let me not worry about the con termination right now I think it's not it's getting too confusing let's just, just write down the encoder here so that I have k bits here okay so I'll simply say I have k bits here for the parity and then what do I do here the crucial thing is this interleaver or permuter which I call pi okay so again produces k input bits which actually go into encoder 2 Okay, in many cases, in fact, yeah, yeah, there is, yeah, 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 yeah. so, no, that's what, that's the definition, don't ask why you define things that way, I'm going to take a recursive thing here, okay, so encoder 2, which is going to have, produce V2, which is again K bits, okay, so maybe you terminate, maybe U has some termination bits, uh, built into it so that that I'll put in K itself okay so let's not worry about it we'll take sufficiently large K so that all these terminations won't matter as far as rate is concerned okay so you put K bits okay so so if you want a definite example here this can be an implementation of 1 plus d power 4 divided by 1 plus d plus d squared plus d power 3 plus d power 4 okay it can be an implementation of that in fact, in many practical cases, people take encoder 2 and encoder 1 to be the same things, exact same implementations. Okay, So this will also be, in many cases, this will also be the same thing. Okay, Or you can put anything else. Okay, So the question was, why do I want this to have feedback? People have found that having feedback is better. Okay, So you'll see, if I don't have feedback, I won't get the, I won't get some gains because of this. Some distances will not play out the way you want. Okay. All right, so this is the overall picture. This is how the picture looks. And uh, can you point out the most complicated component in this whole whole encoder? Pi. Pi. Okay. So if you have thousand bits, interleaving them and putting them out in a random order is one of the <coughs> most complicated things that you're doing here. Because everything else is what simple delay and XOR. So absolutely no complexity in anything else, except for pi, which will require a huge memory and maybe random access, etc., etc. All those things. Will take uh, will take a lot of complexity. Okay, other than that, the encoder for turbo codes. Yeah, just one minute. So, so other than that, the encoder for turbo code is not terribly complicated. Okay, so for instance, if your K is 100, you're not so afraid of a 100-bit permuter. Okay, maybe there is some structure to the permuter, so you can do it in a different way. But in general, a random permuter is tough to implement. Okay, so. So what else? I mean, there are other turbo code structures. This is called, as I said, the parallel concatenated structure. Okay, so this is the parallel concatenated structure. OK, 
okay one can also have serial concatenated turbo codes those have been studied but the parallel concatenation is uh, very popular okay so by design this just becomes a rate 1 by 3 encoder if you want higher rates you have to function for instance the rate half turbo code is again a very classic way of obtaining a rate half turbo code is to take alternative bits from v1 and v2 so you would get a rate half turbo code okay so this is also something we saw in the last class so that's how uh, simple turbo code is uh, put up okay so quick word about termination before i move to the decoder side okay so suppose i terminate for encoder 1 okay okay so i could always terminate for encoder 1 right right i go down the encoder after k bits or whatever k minus m bits i see how many more bits are needed what those bits are okay those is exact message bits to go back to the all zero state okay right but then i have to take this entire block and permute okay and then when i go through encoder 2 there's no guarantee that yeah i mean whatever you do the sequence of other bits that come into encoder 2 might give you take you to some other state okay right it may not be the same uh, the termination bits that were used in the encoder 1 may not work for encoder 2 so there is some complication there okay so it's not very clear how you terminate both encoders maybe you want to terminate both encoders maybe you don't want to terminate both encoders yeah i mean you have to think about all those choices yeah usually don't you don't send the termination bits to the other things okay yeah so i'm going i'm going to comment about that so 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 you do that right so 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 what so so it's possible one can work it around so that you terminate both encoders okay so the point is is it necessary okay so it turns out since k has become really really large you don't really need to terminate see the one problem in viterbi is what when you do only viterbi decoding you need the termination right otherwise you don't know when to stop what to stop and all that so you have to go back to the all zero state only then you will have one survivor path otherwise you will keep getting 2 par m survivor paths in each stage okay the advantage with bitwise map is see bitwise map is going to give you probabilities it won't give you survivor paths at each state it will give you only probability of being in that state conditioned on the past and conditioned on the future okay so suppose you go all the way to the last stage and you don't know how to terminate or you don't know how to start what you do is you assign equal probability for everything and start back on the reverse iteration so the bitwise map decoder is reasonably immune to not terminating but termination actually gives you some gain it's not that it won't give you gain but termination is not necessary for really large block length that's what people have observed in practice so you'd see in several times people won't really terminate particularly turbo codes when you're running bitwise map decoder people don't usually terminate and seems to work fine okay so you don't terminate maybe you terminate only one encoder at best you don't have to terminate both encoders okay the bitwise map decoder can be done and anyway the de decoding will be iterative by the time you do several iterations it's very clear what the final state is you don't have to really know uh, what the exact state okay so termination is an issue it can be solved but usually in practice people don't really do it okay so that's one one more comment i wanted to make uh, that's one thing the next thing to look at in the encoder closely is so one thing i was claiming as a drawback in the convolutional codes was what something about weights right the num because of being lti the number of low weight code words is going to increase linearly with k if you have more k you're going to get keep getting proportionally more uh, low weight code words maybe that's not a good thing so i was, I was claiming that this will help you get over that okay so one one cannot prove those things very rigorously in fact it's possible to prove if you average over all possible interleavers but for a specific interleaver these things are difficult to prove so for instance in books you'll find examples of weight distributions okay complete weight distribution for small lengths okay you enumerate all the code words for small lengths take k equals 10 or something right enumerate all the code words for the convolutional code for the rate half convolutional code and for the punctured rate half turbo code and then when you see that you see that there is a noticeable drop in the number of low weight code words even for very small block lengths there is a small drop particularly when you go to very long block lengths when you go to k equals 100 and all that right well k equals 100 maybe it's tough maybe k equals 30 40 where you can actually enumerate right when you do the entire enumeration run it on a computer for a long time and then see actually how the weight distribution works out you see there is a gain okay number of low weight code words decreases doesn't become zero in many cases if you do a one interleaver you will get the same minimum weight it's not that the minimum weight is going to increase but the number of minimum weight vectors will fall drastically compared to a simple rate half convolutional encoder 
Okay, so it's a huge fall, and that is one of the reasons why turbo codes work at very low SNRs. Okay, so you might be familiar with this. At very high SNRs, one can do something for to compare performance of codes. One can do something called a union bound. Okay, the union bound goes as number of code words of the minimum weight times Q of the distance. Okay, so the number of code words also plays a role. If the number of code words is too large at particularly lower SNRs, when the Q is not too high, not too low to drive everything down, the number of code words will play a big role. And getting that down at lower SNRs makes a big difference in your performance. Okay, if your if your if your SNR is so low, so high, so that the Q really dominates, then this outside constant doesn't really matter. Okay, but for low SNRs, capacity achieving SNRs, right? You really need to control everything. So at that point, these kind of things give you a gain. Okay, I know it was a long lecture. There's no real mathematical support. If you want, I'll give you a examples of books in which this enumeration is done. Okay, that's the only thing you can do. Beyond that, you cannot do. Right? That's the that's the whole philosophy of these capacity achieving codes. You cannot really prove that one code will work perfectly. But in practice, it always works. Okay, that's the that's the that's the justification. Okay, so that that kind of property is called spectral thinning and all that. People have studied this in detail. So spectral thinning really works in this turbo code. Okay, so that's that. With that, we'll stop with the encoder side and why it works. We'll move to the decoder side and try to see if there is a really low complex decoder, soft input decoder that can be implemented for this. Okay, so that's what's important on the decoder side, right? You remember, why did LDPC codes work so much better than Reed Solomon codes? The reasonings we had were there is some random element in the construction which makes the minimum distance grow very well. And then on top of that, there was an implementable soft decision decoder, okay, which was not too complex. Somehow on the encoder side, turbo codes seem to have all those properties. On the decoder side, do we have a nice decoder? Okay, so there's one question. For instance, is there an ML decoder? Okay, it's very unlikely that there will be an ML decoder. Okay, even if it is there, you will have to incorporate the complexity of the interleaver. Okay, previously your memory was what? Only the number of flip-flops in your encoder. Now we want to see a memory. The whole interleaver memory needs to be taken into account. You can't do a state diagram with the interleaver's memory. Okay? It might be very huge. Okay? So you're not going to be able to do, do a complete trellis and there's no way you can do any VW or anything. It won't work. Okay? So you can't have ML decoders and optimal decoders are too complex. Okay? But let's look at what, what an optimal bitwise MAP decoder might want to compute. Okay, so I want to compute probability that UA equals 0 or 1 given what all. Okay, so now I'll have the entire received vector. What is this received vector now for my previous example? If I look at my previous example, what all do I have? I have a set of received vectors corresponding to the systematic part. Then I have a set of received values corresponding to the first encoder's parity. And then I have another set of received values corresponding to the second encoder's parity. I'm going to split my received vector into these three parts and see if I can say anything with those things. Okay, so you'll see with, with just a part of the received vector, it's it's implementable to have a soft decision uh, decoder. Soft decision decoder becomes implementable. And then you see how to work with the whole thing. Okay, so I'm going to split this as R0. Okay, this corresponds to U, and then R1. Okay, this corresponds to V1. Okay, maybe the punctured V1. Okay, so remember R1 need not be the same length as R0. Okay, it could be half in the punctured version. And then I'm going to take R2, which is which corresponds to V2. Okay, so let me put a correspondence in both ways. I'm going to split it like this. If I have all these three received vectors and condition on all these three, I know my my encoding, my decoding is going to be very very complex. But suppose I throw away the conditioning on R2. Suppose I only want to compute these a posteriori probabilities conditioned on R0 and R1. Can I do that? Yeah, you already know you have the bitwise MAP decoder which is going to work, right? So you know that's going to work. So I can do that. Okay, so what can I do? Okay, so this is probably difficult to compute. So what you do is you try to compute probability that ui is 0 given r0 r1 okay 
So maybe I call this, what shall we call this? We'll call this uh, L1i. Okay. So the LL, the the a posteriori LLR according using values only from encoder 1. I'm not using encoder 2 at all. Clearly this is suboptimal, right? This is not the optimal solution. I, I don't need the other encoder and why do I need this? There's no way in which I can, uh, I can claim that this is going to be optimal in any way. Okay. But in fact, how do I know? But, but forgetting about all that, how do I know this will split? This will split as 2 by sigma square times R0i plus L1 extrinsic i. Okay, I know this will split like this. Okay, so let me just compute this and keep it aside. Okay, so one of the one of the significant breakthroughs was to realize that this guy is actually the new information produced by the decoder. Okay, so out of this total thing, li, the new additional information that was produced by the decoder. Okay, so the first part could have been done without any decoding. Right, the new additional thing that was produced was the L1 extrinsic, right? So that was the first thing that people realized. The next thing is, suppose, can I use this now again in some other decoder for the for encoder 2? Okay, so right. So notice I can do the same thing for R0 and R2. That also I can do. If I drop R1 also, I can happily decode with my bitwise MAP decoder. Okay, but if I do that independent of the first decoder. I am not using any information that was produced by the first decoder at all. Okay, So what you do is you try to use just the new information that was produced by the decoder by your first decoder in the second bitwise MAP decoder which uses only R0 and R2 and this extrinsic LLR which is not present in R0. Right? This, this information is not present in R0, it is some, something else. Okay, So the question is how do you incorporate that extrinsic LLR? Okay, so it's actually very easy to incorporate because notice this is actually an LLR, right? Okay, it's, it tells you the log of the probability that ua is zero divided by log of the probability that, I mean, divided by the probability that ua is one. Okay, so that's what it tells you. Okay, so since so this is some kind of uh, extrinsic information produced by the first decoder, which is used as a priori information by the second decoder. Okay, so what is my second decoder? Okay, so this is my first decoder. This is done by the first decoder. Okay, I have a second decoder. Okay, which would normally produce, right? It would normally produce probability that ua is 0 conditioned on r0 and r2. Okay, so this I can easily do but in doing so it will also incorporate l1 x okay so the input to the second decoder is not only r0 and r2 but the extrinsic information that was produced by the first decoder so how do you incorporate that one might say how do i incorporate that okay so it's it's possible to incorporate it you have to incorporate it and so to actually incorporate that i have to dig into the bitwise map algorithm a little bit Okay. So, the bitwise MAP algorithm computes probabilities in the way very similar to the branch matrix. Okay. So, you have a way of incorporating this extrinsic information into the branch matrix computed by the bitwise MAP decoder. Okay. It is actually very easy to do. It is not very difficult. It can be done. Okay. So, this is incorporated in where? Incorporated in branch matrix of bitwise MAP decoder. Okay. Okay. So that's why when you write down the bitwise MAP decoder, the inputs for the bitwise MAP decoder will be three things. First is R0, the received values corresponding to the systematic part. Then it's either R1 or R2, depending to uh, depending on which decoder it is. For decoder one, it's going to be R1. For decoder two, it's going to be R2, the received values corresponding to the corresponding parity parts. Okay. Then you'll have the third input, which is the a priori information available to that decoder. Where is it available from? From the run of the other decoder. Okay. In the very first run for the first decoder, what is the a priori information? There is no a priori information. 
but for the first run of the second decoder you already have some a priori information which you have to incorporate into the branch metric of the bitwise MAP decoder okay since I did not discuss the bitwise MAP decoder in detail maybe it's not clear to you but what the bitwise MAP decoder does for branch metric is it computes some LLR for each branch okay so you can easily incorporate another LLR from something else you simply add the two LLRs right so assuming they are independent you add the two LLRs how do you combine several LLRs we did this in message passing also you can add them once you assume they are independent so you would add the two LLRs and you would put them in the okay, each branch the yeah it would justify the independence that's justified by saying that uh, k will tend to infinity and your interleaver is random enough that's the justification. okay all right so that's what we do uh, that's what we do here so if you stopped here it turns out turbo decoders don't do all that great okay so the trick is to try to repeat this go back somehow to the first decoder once again and then use so try to repeat the same procedure okay so that is that is the trick so for that you need some kind of a model for the LLR that's produced by the second decoder okay so that model works as follows okay so you assume that the LLR produced by the second decoder okay Okay, based on the independence assumption will look like L2 i equals 2 by sigma square R0 i plus L1 i x plus L2 i x. Okay, so remember what was the LLR produced by the uh, by the first decoder? It was 2 by sigma square ri0 plus the extrinsic okay that l1 extrinsic became input to the second decoder okay so you you say that what is produced now by the second decoder is the systematic llr plus the a priori llr that it got as input plus the new extrinsic information that it is adding okay so this is the systematic part This is actually extrinsic from the first decoder, which I'm going to say as a priori LLR. And then this is the extrinsic LLR. Okay. So that's so. Okay, I didn't write this down very clearly. Let me write it down once again. Okay that's extrinsic once I split it like this okay I can now go back to the first decoder all over again what will I use as a priori information there I'll use l2 x okay so that's important because you notice one of the principles of message passing is what you don't send back what you got right so you only send what you generated new okay so that's one more so that's another principle that's being enforced here so that helps us in maintaining the independence Okay, so once the independence is maintained, I can combine LLR in the same way I did and then hope to get better and better information. Now I can keep on iterating, first decoder, second decoder, back to first decoder, then back to second decoder, first, second, first, second, go on back and forth, back and forth. And it turns out once you do some 15 or 20 iterations, these turbo decoders really can take you very, very close to capacity. Okay, under suitable designs of course, we do a lot of design, but they can take you to capacity. So the trick is again to do these iterations. Okay. So this apparently is similar to the action of a turbo engine. I don't know how many of you know engines and motors. I don't know very well, but apparently the turbo engine and cars and all these other uh, mechanical things do such things. Okay, so they do. I don't know what they do. So this, there are two things which go back and forth. Okay, so some heat is produced, which is used by something else, etc., etc. Okay, so that's why it was called the turbo code and the turbo decoder. <coughs> Even today, the the thing is uh, very popular. Okay, so it's a very popular notion. Actually, one can see it as an instance of message passing. It's possible to see this kind of thing as an instance of message passing. Okay. So what I'm going to do next is to write down, uh, do two things. First thing I'm going to do is to write down a step-by-step -step description of the turbo decoder. The next is to draw a block diagram. Okay. Just to give you an. Okay. First, let's draw a block diagram, and then we'll write down the step-by-step -step, uh, description. That's probably better. Okay. So here's how a block diagram will look. Let me see if I can 
get this uh, out very clearly. I'm going to first draw the two two decoders. Okay, so this is remember when I say decoder, it is the bitwise MAP decoder. Okay. Okay, so there is some one minor problem which I did not write down clearly in the previous step. The input to the second decoder should be a permuted version of the input to the first decoder, right? So that that needs to be taken care of. So when I write down the block diagram, I will put those permutations in the middle. Okay, so you'll see there'll be an invert permutation required before you go back to the first decoder again. So all these things will show up, and you'll see how it works. Out. Okay. So one thing that is common to both is what one received value which is common to both is R0, right? R0 is common to both, but R0 goes directly into the first decoder, and after after a permutation to the second decoder. Okay, so that's what happens. So how do I nicely draw that? Let me think. Okay, so I'll draw it here. Hopefully, hopefully it should be okay. I'll draw it here, and then I'll say this is a permuter pi. And it goes to second decoder. This is R0. Okay, well I am not able to draw the line below, so I'll raise it up a little bit and draw it. Oops. Okay, so that is R0, right? Both of these are inputs to the uh, to the first decoder. Okay, so the decoder one also has. Well, let me write down uh, decoder one produces. Two things, right? It produces the total uh, LLR and also produces extrinsic LLR. So the extrinsic LLR, I guess, let me draw it here. Okay, so it's going to come out, but I'll have to permute the extrinsic LLRs also, right? By when I produce it in one sequence, they need to be permuted before they go to the second decoder. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, yeah, they have to be permuted. Okay, so I'm going to permute here. I'll, I'll write down here. This is L1 X. Okay, I'm going to permute it. Send it to the second decode. Okay, so that happened. Fine. It also produces a total LLR. What will you do for the total LLR? Yeah. After whenever you have to make a decision, you'll use the total LLR to make a decision, right? Final decision. What is the final decision in terms of LLR? If it's positive, it is bit zero. If it is negative, it is bit 1 right that's the ratio so that, that decision you have to make based on the total llr okay so one can imagine how to produce these things and then what does decoder 2 do it uses both these informations and produces two things once again which is l2 and then l2 x so what do you do for l2 x now back but you have to do the inverse of this permutation goes back l2 that's it oh i have to show r1 and r2 <laughs> okay r1 and r2 go r1 goes to decoder 1 i'll show r2 here i mean you know i mean technically i think there's a permutation required for r2 also no 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 permutation i guess r2 can R2 can just go. Okay, everybody happy? Any other block that I missed out? Okay, that's fine. So how many other iterations you want to do? You do. Okay, that's fine. So but remember the bitwise MAP will produce only L2 on its own. Okay, to produce and in fact what will happen is when you run uh, when you run the bitwise MAP decoder with R0 and R1, it will produce only L1. To get L1 next, you have to subtract. 2 by sigma square r0 from l1 okay so that's why if you see the way they write it out the formulas will work out like this l1 x people will write as l1 minus okay the entire vector l1 minus r0 times 2 by sigma square okay you have to do this computation explicitly subtract it and then send it out roughly okay yeah minus uh, L2 x in the previous iteration. Yeah, you're right. L2 x. Okay, so I should say previous, no? 
<laughs> it's just getting too messy. So I'll say previous year, just like that. Okay, what is previous? Whatever was received in the previous iteration. For instance, in the first iteration, what will this be? Zero. Okay, you have to set that to zero. Okay. So now uh, L two X will will have a similar computation, right? But you might want to introduce the permutations if you want. Okay. So you can talk about the permutation because the input to the decoder two is permuted version of R zero, then R one, and then permuted version of L one. Text. Okay, so decoder two produces L two. Okay, so so there are several ways of writing it. So for instance, one can say L two equals decoder two of of what pi of R zero comma R two comma pi of L one X. And then you write L two X equals L2 minus 2 by sigma square R0 minus L1 x. Okay, and then you do a pi inverse of that to get back to L2 x previous. Okay, L2 x previous will be pi inverse of that guy. And then once you do that, you run your decoder one again to give you L1. Okay, so that's all. You keep on proceeding like this. You get the whole iteration. Okay, so one can write down a step by step description of the same thing, which maybe I think I've started off. Maybe I should uh, maybe I should complete it. Okay, so I'll do that right now, and then we'll call it a day. Any questions about how this how this is working? Okay. So typical number of iterations in practice, you might want to do five to ten or something. But in theory, if you do twenty, you get very very good performance usually. Okay, it just you'll see a nice big difference between the first iteration and the last iteration. A huge huge gain will be there because of uh, turbo decoding. Okay. So maybe let me write down all these things uh, carefully uh, one after the other. I'll, I'll just mark it out so that I can copy and paste it in the other thing, and then I will I will write it write it out in a for this. Oops, what happened? Why did this go all the way here? I don't want it to go. All the way. It didn't select, no. Okay, some weird thing has happened. It has resized it. Okay. Okay. Let's just try pasting it again. If it doesn't work, I'll remove it. So, there you go. Yeah, it's fine. This works. This works. This works. This works. Oh, some line I picked up from somewhere. Huh? Okay. All right. So let me start and write down what all needs to be done step by step. Okay. So, oops. I really don't like the way it marks. <laughs> okay. We'll move this. Oops. It's getting very clumsy. Okay, okay, it's moving, it's moving, it's moving, it's moving. It's, it's moves there. Okay, so that's fine. So, so if, if the, this whole thing has to be put in a loop, right? You have so many iterations. Your inputs initially are what? R0, R1, R2, and you set, you set what? You set uh, L2 x previous to zero. Zero, and then you put this whole thing in a loop. What is the loop? So maybe say for i equals one two, okay, whatever whatever number you want here, maximum iterations. Right. So the first step is what l one equals l one equals decoder one r zero r one comma L two x previous. Okay, so based on this, you compute L one x. There's no problem. Then you run L two again. Then you set L two x previous to be pi inverse of L two. So I have to compute L two x now. I'm sorry. 
okay so maybe i'll do this yeah i can just run right on the computation here no l2 minus 2 by sigma square r0 minus pi of l oh pi no it's pi here also minus pi of l1 so all these pi's are just to keep the notation consistent if you understand that there is a permutation i can just drop it okay but just to keep it consistent this whole thing is there and then you finish it up okay so you end it okay and then uh, make decisions based on l2 okay decide based on it okay if l2i is greater than 0 you say the bit was 0 otherwise you say the bit was 1 okay sounds very simple if you if you want to analyze all this it takes it takes i mean can one do density evolution is the question okay i said it's the same as message similar to similar to message passing can one do density evolution density evolution becomes hopelessly difficult because see remember why were we able to do density evolution at the end of the day for ldpc codes the operations at the bit node and check node were not complex okay so <laughs> by the time i wrote it down it might have seemed like log tan hyperbolic is complex but at the end of the day they are simple but the bitwise map decoder what it does cannot be written in a statement like that you cannot do anything analytical to figure out relationship between output pdf and input pdf the only way you can do it is by simulation so people would simulate it for a long time and find the histograms for the uh, llrs and based on that postulate a relationship between output pdf and input pdf and based on monte carlo simulations you can do density evolution all that stuff is possible people talk about thresholds and all that but it's not as rigorous as the not 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 even as rigorous as the <coughs> the analysis for the ldpc codes okay so it's a little less analysis i haven't personally done that many simulations with turbo codes but i would imagine yes i would imagine that even turbo codes would not converge to the wrong code word uh, very often I, i would imagine but I, i could be wrong i mean i could be wrong but i think it's one thing that is known about turbo codes okay so for instance so error floors are a bit of a problem with turbo codes so what happens is in if you do okay there should be really a way of drawing straight lines in this uh, in this program right it's after all a computer program but it requires a lot of skill okay if you do a ber versus snr plot okay for a turbo code typically what happens is so first iteration it will be very bad and then slowly it will improve for instance for rate half codes if you have say 0 db here 0 db here for a well well designed rate of code one can expect down to 10 power minus 5 one can expect the performance at somewhere around 1 db okay less than 1 db okay so what happens to turbo codes is maybe this is because of wrong convergence okay i don't know what happens to turbo codes is after 10 power minus 5 typically for turbo codes the drop is not drop does not continue it tends to flow as in it tends to do this Okay, so this is the error floor region. Okay, so one can try to push it down. One can try to push the 10 power minus 5 down a little bit, but that ends up being more complex. So, so what do I mean by complexity? So I should first go back and look at complexity of this decoder, right? So let's go back and see the decoder and figure out how complex it is. Remember, each decoder has the complexity roughly proportional to 2 power m. Okay, right? Two power m is the number of states. Okay. Yeah. So something like that. So roughly number of states. So what will happen is you want to do like ten iterations, which means the number of states has to be really low. It cannot be as much as six or seven. Okay. So if if you have if you have sixty four states, then you can't run these Viterbi like algorithms ten times, twenty times. Okay. So this is too complicated. So typically in practical implementations, people will take only three state. encoders okay so in which case each decoder has only eight states okay and then you can imagine running it some five or six times it's not too bad in today's vlsi one can get it into the chip okay so it's difficult with other uh, uh, like even for a dsp these things are difficult but from vlsi you can put it in there and produce an asic it will work it will work quite well if you have an eight state uh, eight state uh, encoder you can do it okay so that's the level of complexity okay so if you want to keep the complexity low have just 
eight state encoders you will see this error floor and it will be quite prominent at 10 power minus 5 okay when you design ldpc codes usually you don't see this error floor at 10 power minus 5 you will have to go down all the way to at least like 10 power minus 7 10 power minus 8 i think before you see it because in practical simulations you cannot really go way be below 10 power minus 6 why can i not go below 10 power minus 6 yeah, to get good statistics, you'll have to run like 10 power 8, 10 power 9 and with computers today, it's difficult to run those kind of things, right? So, it's difficult to get, but in turbo codes, you can observe the error flow with simulation. So, 10 power minus 5, it starts hitting at error flow, okay? Which is probably slightly bad, okay? So, this something happens, something that happens, yeah, just one minute. So, I think to avoid this, you might want to increase the number of states, but if you increase the number of states, the code becomes a little less practical because you have to do a lot of iterations, okay? So, I, the question was about intuition for why there is an error flow here, I, I really do not know, maybe at some level these are less random than the LDPC codes, so you still have this sequential thing, okay, so if you actually look at the distance properties, you will see the minimum weight uh, code words do not become really very less, okay, they do not, they will decrease compared to the convolutional codes, but they do not go to near zero numbers, okay, in LDPC codes it will happen like that, okay, when you, when you generate an LDPC code, and try to find its low weight code words, you will hardly ever find any. It is very difficult to find low weight code words in an LDPC code. Okay? So, people have even proven that. Okay? So, in, in turbo codes, it is not too bad. You can find some low weight code words without too much trouble, which means there are quite a few of them, and that, that maybe is the reason why this error flow actually shows. Okay? But there is no more intuition than that. Okay? So, you can run it and see that the error flow is shown. Okay, so that's one problem with turbo codes, but still, it's mean 10 power minus 5 is good enough for so many applications, right? And maybe you put an outer code outside to bring it down further. Okay, one great selling point is your encoder is not that complex. Only thing you have is an interleaver, on, but on the, for the LDPC code, you probably have a huge uh, Gaussian elimination type things, a big matrix sitting there. It's, it's much more complicated than what you can imagine. Okay, so there are applications because of uh, this kind of a problem. Okay, so that pretty much winds up what I wanted to do with turbo codes. Okay, yes. Yeah, it can be L1 also if you want, you can do it. For instance, the question is, she is asking, so can I make a decision based on L1? Okay, so for the LDPC codes, you had a condition for stopping. If all the parity checks are satisfied, you know it was a code word. Here, what will you do? Right, if you have a CRC or something sitting outside, so by CRC, I mean something called a cyclic redundancy check which will tell you if something is valid or not. Then you can stop based on somewhere in the middle. But otherwise, how do you stop somewhere in the middle with the turbo code? I mean, it's difficult to know just by looking at a sequence whether it's a valid path on your trellis or not. It's not so easy. Okay, but for the LDPC code, it's very easy because the your operations itself are based on the check node and at each check node, you can easily compute the check and see if it's satisfied. So that thing is a little bit difficult in turbo codes. But in practice, even for LDPC code, the way your architectures are today for systems, you can't just stop after one iteration if you want. Okay, the rest of the system will only expect a code word after the time it takes for 20 iterations. So, you better do the 20 iterations, right? You can't design a system with uh, varying delays. Okay, usually people never do. So, this notion of stopping in the middle may not be that relevant. Okay, yeah, but if you want to, you can decide based on L1. Nobody stops. Sir, why two encoders and two decoders? Can't we have like yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, those are all generalizations. See, remember, I, I am giving you a very primitive, simple form of the turbo code. People have done lots of research to have so many other constructions. In fact, one of the most startling constructions for, for turbo-like codes, it's what's called a repeat accumulate code. If you get a chance, read, uh, read a little bit more about these codes. Repeat accumulate codes. It's nothing. What it does is, you have a bunch of code words, you repeat. What, is, what, what do I mean by repeat? It's just repetition. If you have k bits here, you get, say, some 3 k bits. Then what you do is, you put a permuter here. Okay? You put a permuter here. And then you do accumulate. What is accumulate? Accumulate is basically differential encoding, if you know what I mean. So, you, you keep doing this, uh, this, this delay sum. Just a one state, one state thing. You do this. This is an accumulator. So at every point, sum of all the previous things is being sent out. Okay, accumulator. You get code word. You get a code word here, which will again be three k bits, right? So it's roughly a three one one by three code. Okay, so you get three k bits here. Okay, and now you can have a turbo-like decoder. You have a decoder for this accumulator, which is just a one-state uh, 
I mean, one, one two state uh, bitwise MAP, which is very fast. And then you go through the permuter and then do a decode of the repetition code, which is again very trivial. You go back and forth. Guess how well this code does? It does very well. No, it's not too bad. In fact, in, there are the possibility to make this irregular, the repetition irregular. If you make the repetition irregular and optimize, you can show this gets close to capacity in in some channels. Okay. So this this is just a simple example to show you that you can go both ways. You can you can take a very simple construction. What is the moral of the story here? Not doing anything great. The code is essentially very simple. What is the moral of the story here? Is sitting some something is sitting there which is changing the whole thing up, right? And uh, you have a random element and you have an implementable soft decision decoder, right? For both things and you can iterate back and forth and you get good gains, right? So there are so many other constructions like this. Like you said, I mean, why, why not only two encoders? Why don't you put more encoders? Yeah, why don't why don't you put it in parallel? Why can't you put it in serial? Why can't you put part serial, part parallel? Believe me, people have done research for 15 years and they have explored every single possibility. So I think at this point I can even declare research in turbo and LDPC codes is saturating. It's finished. <laughs> Move to something else. Right? So that's the kind of. Uh, <coughs> but this construction is very very interesting. It's a repeat accumulate construction. There's a lot of theoretical properties which are very very interesting. Okay, so some various things exist. For instance, somebody is reading turbo product code. No, who's doing it? You're doing it. That's another construction which is motivated by this turbo decoding, which again is a very simple decoder, but it ends up performing very well. Okay, so all these things are uh, things to keep in mind. Okay, stop here.